At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Welcome back. I'm glad you came back to episode 18 of the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time, well, thanks for coming along. I hope you're going to find some great information for you about cannabis, as that's what we talk about. I've been stressed lately, trying to find the time to get this done with my job as a bud tender, making me a little busier than I thought I was going to be. But nonetheless, here we are, and let's get started with what we've got coming for you this week. We are going to catch up on some cannabis news, a bunch of little items I've found from this last week. We'll talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about our experience with Overgrow Canada this year. We have made our plantings. We'll chat a bit about that. I also wanted to take a retrospective look at 420, not only at the event that happened just a week or two ago, but also the history behind it, where 420 came from, and also a look at what has happened after the various 420 events across our country. It certainly divided our country. It showed us that there is still a hell of a lot of stigma out there. We'll chat a bit about that. Plus, I teased you last week with some big news from my musicologist, my son Ian, and I'm going to share that news with you today. And thanks to the beauty of cannabis memory, I'm going to dig up another memory made sharper through the use of cannabis. All of that is coming your way on episode 18 of the Cannabis Podcast. And now it is my pleasure to share with you the news that I teased you about in the last episode regarding my son Ian who any listener of the podcast knows, has been contributing since the very first days of the podcast, especially the tune for Cultivar Corner, which I'm not doing this week. I do not have a cultivar, (laughs) although I know I have played that in the past when I didn't have one, but I won't do that to you today. But the news I wanted to share with you about my oldest son is he got married. And it's official now, truly official, because he made the announcement on Facebook just the other day. And it was so pleasing to hear. Uh, Ian is obviously our first child, and it's always nice when your first child gets married. And he has found a lovely lady from Latvia named Christine, and they headed to the pier in North Vancouver a few weeks ago, mid-April, I guess. And it was a surprise to everyone in the family. We found out a few days before. But what they wanted to do was just have a quiet little ceremony with a couple of friends, a justice of the peace, get married, and start their new life together. And that is exactly what they have done. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome Christine into our family. Everybody else in the family has welcomed her as well, Ian's sister and his brother. The whole family is thrilled to have Christine joining us. So that's the news that I was teasing you about last week. We've been pretty thrilled about it. In fact, there are times throughout the day where I sit back and I go, wow, wow, my oldest son is married. (laughs) So I now have two married sons. I guess that's all the sons I have, actually. (laughs) And both of them are now married. We're about to find out, I think, something that might be happening with our daughter. We'll find out about that. That's another tease I'll give you. She's coming for a visit in just a week from today, the day that I'm recording this. She will be here in a week with her new beau from Australia. And who knows, I may have more news to share with you about that. But please, join me in congratulating my son Ian and Christine on their marriage, April 14th of 2019. From the cannabis-infused studio in the clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Now, I also have been talking a little bit ever since we had the interview with Dana Larson a few episodes back, and he talked about Overgrow Canada, 2019, where they have distributed just millions and millions of cannabis seeds over the years. 2019 was no exception. I put my name into the list. I got my 100 cannabis seeds. This particular strain is uh, CBD was, I think, at about 7 or 8 percent, and the THC was about 1 or 2 percent. So nobody's going to get really high over any of this cannabis, but we did our part. (laughs) It was quite interesting taking those 100 seeds and germinating them, 
found a little tray that they all managed to fit in, and we did our bit and germinated them over a period of a week or so. My goodness, <laughs> when you put a hundred seeds in a little container and germinate them all, it is astounding how well they germinate, how fast, and how long those little seedlings got before we were ready to plant them. But we did. We took off one Saturday morning into an area around where we live, and we picked a park where there's a fair amount of traffic, but there's lots of areas within that park that are also kind of remote, and we figured that was a good place to put these. So I'm not sure if we planted all 100 of them. We probably got, oh, we probably got about 75 plantings, I guess, uh, over the period of time. I didn't realize how long it takes <laughs> to take all of those germinated seeds, put them in the ground, give them a little water, see what they're doing for you. And that did take a little bit longer than we had anticipated, but they're in the ground. We haven't gone back for a peek to see how they have been handling the weather since they were planted. We'll probably do that this next week and take a peek at where they are in their development. As Overgrow Canada gave a whole bunch of people 100 seeds, and I think there was about 1.9 million seeds again distributed this year to make cannabis a more normal plant in our environment to, again, help to cut down some of the stigma that we continue to see. So we'll keep you apprised of what happens with our plants as the summer progresses, in addition to the plants that we have ready to go into our yard. Because not only did we do our Overgrow Canada piece, but like I have said before, we planted some seeds last year. This year, we got our seeds. They have been germinated, two sativas, two indicas, and they are ready to go into the garden in probably the next week or two. Actually, probably about two or three. I leave the decision on that to my wife. <laughs> She's the better gardener, the one who has spent more time in the garden. I only become interested in gardening when it comes to cannabis plants. <laughs> so my interest is very, very limited and tiny. She will be the deciding factor, but they are doing really nicely. And we're probably going to pop those into the ground soon. We've found a place. We've ex actually expanded our garden so that the cannabis plants kind of have a space all on their own at the side of the garden, not visible, of course, from any public space, so that we can grow our four cannabis plants here in the province of British Columbia. And we are looking forward to watching all of that grow this year. And I thought it was appropriate this week that we take a little time to look at some of the weird stories that are still happening in regards to cannabis, because there are a whole bunch bunch of them out there. Stories about uh, new methods for testing for cannabis at the roadside. Stories about what happens if you buy cannabis in particular provinces. Some of these are just downright scary. Let's start there. Let's start with the story that I came across this last week. And uh, thanks to Jody Emery, I picked it up from a tweet from her. I have posted the link to the story and the story is from the growth op. And the headline, what can happen if you buy illegal cannabis in Ontario? <laughs> We've talked about this a whole bunch since legalization has occurred, since the start of this podcast on December 1st of 2018. And one of the topics that continues to come up is the stigma, the stigma that still applies to any cannabis use, and the fact that even though we have reached legalization, <laughs> we are in no way, and by we I mean the cannabis industry, are in no way still held in the same regard as the alcohol industry who can get away with so much. I mean, goodness sakes. I remember a time when alcohol was not allowed to advertise. You couldn't say that you had beer on special on a Friday night. Now, absolutely, you can do it. There are commercials on radio all the time for beer and alcohol specials. In relation to cannabis, of course, we can't advertise any of that as of this point. And now it's just getting worse. In fact, now there are more ways to get busted and larger penalties when you do get busted than ever existed prior to legalization. Absolutely insane. And this story is one really good example of that. So let me dive into this story from the growth op. Penalties are possible for those thumbing their noses at the rules, but current reticence to go the enforcement distance could derail efforts to get consumers out of the illicit market. And boy, is that ever true. Many illicit storefronts pressing on despite their threat of search, seizure, and other actions, and we find those in British Columbia as well. But Ontario's government is setting its eyes on the consumer. 
They're coming after us, folks. Though an understated feature of Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act, which has similar language to its Ontario counterpart, notes that no person shall purchase cannabis except from an authorized cannabis retailer. The Act makes clear that buying marijuana through anyone outside of provincially sanctioned entities, in Ontario that would be in person and approved private retail stores, but mostly online at the Ontario Cannabis Store, anyone doing so can be met with a fine of up to $100,000 and imprisonment for up to one year. Seriously? <laughs> this just keeps getting weirder, folks. Carrying on with this story, the province has recently emboldened its stance through the public service announcement building on an existing campaign that warns Ontarians that cannabis packages not bearing the Ontario authorized seal could cost them a lot more than their dispensary bought pre rule. Wow. The risk is real, but is the likelihood of punishment? According to the story, experts in cannabis law are skeptical. I would be surprised to know of anybody who has been sentenced to imprisonment for those offenses in the last long while, says Defense Attorney John Conroy, QC of Conroy & Company. Conroy suggests that only in more extreme cases would a conviction or hefty fine be applied, such as selling cannabis to a minor or large-scale trafficking. Now, is the likelihood of punishment hypothetical at this point? Following a discussion with cannabis-focused lawyer Harrison Jordan, it seems much of the Cannabis Act's implementation regarding the purchase of illicit cannabis, for the time being at least, is hypothetical. At least theoretically, you could be subject to certain penalties, says Jordan, who guides individuals and small businesses through the Act's murky waters. For possession of a small amount, theoretically a single gram, but largely up to the officer's discretion, police have the ability to issue a provincial or federal ticket, he explains that, but doubts that the Crown would ever ask to seek imprisonment. And Conroy agrees, though he supposes it might wrap a few knuckles while trying to push consumers out of the underground market. The judges may be more severe initially, but I suspect imprisonment will be limited to those serious breaches, says Conroy. Wow, this is absolutely astounding. I can't believe we've now reached the point where they're cracking down, and we knew it was going to happen, because obviously we also know that the black market is still pretty strong. There's a lot of activity occurring out there in the black market. A lot of people are still using it, and why are they still using it? And, and this is the part that still astounds me. And we had this discussion many, many times when people come in, and my job is a bun tender, that they can't believe how slow, here in BC anyways, how slow the provincial government has been about creating any licenses for people to use. If you can't buy it legally in the city where you live and you're getting what is considered to be not very good product when you purchase it online from the government stores, what are people going to do? They're going to go back to their sources or perhaps even find new sources where they can get some quality cannabis at a reasonable price and if that happens to be on the black market, well, many people are still doing that. The answer, in my mind, is let's get full retail going. Let's get rid of this damn stigma. Stop trying to push the cannabis stores into weird places of the city because nobody wants to be by a cannabis store. I'm starting to get a little pissed off at what's happening with some of these retail laws. Starting to get my ire going a bit. And this one particular story has certainly stirred my ire. So there you go. If you are in Ontario, look out. There could be further penalties coming for you if you buy your cannabis from an illicit source and not from any of the legal government stores. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo, coming this May 12-15 to 15 to Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Level up your industry intel at the Lift Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250-plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lifting Co. Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And I want to thank my friends at the Okanagan Z. OkanaganZ.com, doing some great coverage of marijuana news. And I thank the Okanagan Z for this story, which is about another test coming to the roadside to detect the presence of cannabis in a suspected impaired driver. It's the So 
Toxa test, or So Toxa test. I guess it would probably be So Toxa, S O T O X A. Another police saliva test is just down the road, this from the OZ. While many Canadians were a little preoccupied on 420, our federal government made a more quiet announcement. It published a statement through the Canada Gazette, and I have listed the article to the Canada Gazette back on the website, so you can check out the details of that for yourself. It is in the process of adding another roadside screening device to the police toolkit. The device, which goes by the name of Sotoxa, or Sotoxa, I'll figure it out myself, (laughs) It still needs to be approved by the Attorney General of Canada before it can be used by law enforcement. It is certainly a unique name, according to the Oz, but if you search So Talks Online, there's very little information out there. So they did a little digging for us. So what is it then? Well, change your search to Allaire, A-L-E-R-E, and then you'll get some information about the Allaire DDS-2. So, Toxa's previous identity. Now, it's been rebranded, at least for Canada, as the Abbott Sotoxa Oral Fluid Collection Device. Oh, it just sounds delightful, doesn't it? Problems with the Allaire device are well documented, including a report from the Government of Canada that found serious concerns. And once again, I'll post a link to that. In a blog post, VancouverCriminalLaw.com says, The devices have a 7% malfunction rate. Seven times out of 100, the test just won't work. They say officers listed the reasons as due to temperature, power or battery, weather or unknown reasons. Despite its rocky history, Canada's Federal Drugs and Driving Committee has recommended its approval. The company, meanwhile, is doing a good enough PR job to have media reporting it's a faster, better THC test. Then again, police currently use the Draeger 5000, which has its own issues. Some more changes coming on the roadside as our federal and provincial governments continue to find ways to identify the impaired cannabis drivers out there. And once again, I'll raise the fact that impairment between cannabis and impairment of alcohol have no relation. It's like comparing apples and oranges. I understand impairment. I get all that. uh, And I'm not going to get into all of those details. But once more, here we go. They're trying to find another way to find more ways to arrest us and bust us for cannabis possession in one way or another. (laughs) Legalization certainly has its challenges, and now there's even more challenges coming to our roadside. It seems really appropriate to me that on episode 18, which is dropping a week after the actual 420 day of 2019, that we take a peek back at what happened in 420. And before we look at what happened on that specific day, here in the Okanagan, in Vancouver, where there was a huge celebration, celebrations all across the country, exactly, celebrations and protests, according to some. But I thought it was appropriate that we take a step back to where did 420 come from? There's a lot of speculation. There's been some false stories out there as well. But I found a story on the Huffington Post which was actually produced, I think, two years ago is when it first appeared. And it kind of summarizes precisely where the phrase 420 came from. And then once it got started, as we have seen, it has exponentially, its use has grown exponentially around the world, with 420 becoming the de facto way for us to refer to each other as stoners, a time to get stoned, an event that's going to happen, 420 has become kind of all-encompassing. The Huffington Post chased the term back to its roots. And I'm going to read a bit of this story for you now. They found in a lost patch of cannabis in a Point Rise, California forest. Now, just as entering as its origin, it turns out, is how it spread. And it starts with the Grateful Dead. It was Christmas week in Oakland in 1990 when Stephen Bloom was wandering through The Lot, a timeless gathering of hippies that springs up in the parking lot before every Grateful Dead concert, when suddenly a deadhead handed him a yellow flyer. We're going to meet at 420, on 420 for 420, in Marin County at the Bolinas Ridge Sunset Spot, read the message. Bloom, who was then a reporter for High Times Magazine, and is now the publisher of CelebStoner.com and co-author of Pot Culture, had never heard of 420 before. And the flyer came complete with the 420 backstory. 
420 started somewhere in San Rafael, California in the late 1970s. It started as the police code for marijuana smoking in progress. After local heads heard of the police call, they started using the expression 420 when referring to Herb. Let's go 420, dude. Although I myself have never heard it used in that context as in as a verb, it's always been kind of a time and a reference for me. Now, Bloom reported this find in the May 1991 issue of High Times, which the magazine found in its archives and provided to the Huffington Post. The story, though, was only partially right. It had nothing to do with a police code, though the San Rafael part was right. Indeed, it was a group of five San Rafael high school friends known as the Waldos, by virtue of their chosen hangout spot, a wall outside the school. They coined the term in 1971. The Huffington Post spoke with Waldo Steve, Waldo Dave, and Dave's older brother Patrick, and confirmed their full name and identities, which they asked to keep secret for professional reasons. I mean, pot is still pot, after all. <laughs> The Waldos never envisioned that pot smokers the world over would celebrate each April 20th as a result of their foray into the Point Reyes forest. The day has managed to become something of a national holiday in the face of official condemnation. This year's celebration, of course, was no different. Now, the code often creeps into popular culture, according to this story, and mainstream settings as well. All of the clocks in Pulp Fiction, for instance, are set to 420. In 2003, when the California legislature codified the medical marijuana law voters had approved, the bill was named SB 420. The code pops up on Craig's listing posts when fellow smokers search for 420-friendly roommates. It's just a vaguer way of saying it, and it kind of makes it kind of cool, says Bloom. Like, you know, you're in the know. But that doesn't show you know it's in the mainstream. And the Waldos do have proof that they used the term in the early 70s in the form of an old 420 flag and numerous letters with 420 references and early 70 postmarks. And they also have a story. In the fall of 1971, harvest time, the Wallows got word of a Coast Guard service member who could no longer tend to his pot of marijuana plants near the Point Reyes Peninsula Coast Guard Station. A treasure map in hand, the Waldos decided to pluck some of this free bud. Now, the Waldos were all athletes and agreed to meet at the statue of Louis Pasteur outside the school at 4.20, after practice, to begin the hunt. They would remind each other in the hallways we were supposed to meet up at 4.20. It originally started out at 4.20 Louis, with the destination in mind, but they eventually dropped the Louis part. Now, their first forays out were unsuccessful, but the group kept looking for the hidden crop. And as fortune would have it, it was the collapse of San Francisco's hippie utopia in the late 60s that set the stage for the spread of 420. As speed freaks, thugs, and con artists took over the heat, the Grateful Dead picked up and moved to the Marin County Hills just blocks from San Rafael High School. And Marin County was kind of ground zero for the counterculture. The Waldos had more than just a geographic connection to the dead. Mark Waldo's father took care of real estate for the dead, and Waldo Dave's older brother Patrick managed a dead sideband and was good friends with bassist Phil Lesh. Patrick tells the Huffington Post that he smoked with Lesh on numerous occasions, but he couldn't recall if he used the term 420 around him, but guessed that he must have. The dead, recalls Waldo Steve, had this rehearsal hall on Front Street, San Rafael, and they used to practice there, so we would go hang out and listen to them play music and get high while they were practicing for gigs. I think it's possible my brother Patrick might have spread it through Phil Lesh, and me too, because I was hanging out with Lesh and his band when they were doing a summer tour, and my brother was managing. Hey, 420 spread around the world, and we saw an example of that this last week with 420 events in Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, all over the place. And now you know the true story of where 420 originated. I thought that needed a bit of clarity. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And to finish up this episode... I'm going to do another flashback. Back to the days before 420 existed. We did not have the code word 420 back in the days when this happened. And this is another example of why I'm really glad that I don't live in Manitoba now. I used to. This story is a Manitoba story back when we lived in Winnipeg. 
Now, of course, in Manitoba, you cannot grow your four cannabis plants, as I'm planning to do here in British Columbia. Unrelated to the growing of plants, this story is kind of related to just public displays of cannabis use. (laughs) When I was confronted by my brothers, I have three of them, and on this one particular occasion, they came to visit us in Winnipeg. It was rare for people to come visit us, but when they did, they made a big deal out of it. And there's one particular time I was working at a radio station in Winnipeg and my three brothers decided to come out and pay us a visit. Back in those days, I had a little four-track studio up in the in the, one of the bedrooms of the house we lived in. And I used to play with some music. I was never really a good guitarist. I, I wrote a few songs that never amounted to much because you haven't heard them. <laughs> in fact, I have a bunch of tapes up in our attic that I was just musing the other day that I should go back through those and see if I can actually find the song that I'm going to reference. Because back in those days, when I did have some time, I was writing some music, and it was uh, protest music, protesting about cannabis. And this was probably, um, this, well, I won't even give you a date. It was, it was a long, long time ago. Trust me for that. I had written this one particular protest song, and I cannot remember the lyrics, but it was something like, you know, Light that joint and hold it high. Show the world that you're proud that you get high. You know, something like that. It probably had a better rhythm structure than that. (laughs) But the mistake I made was when my brothers came to visit me in Winnipeg, and they visited both my wife and I, obviously. (laughs) And when they did, I played them a bunch of my songs, including this one particular protest song about raising that joint high in the air and not being afraid to show. (laughs) Well, did that come back to bite me, so to speak? As I mentioned, this was in Winnipeg. This was back in the day where now, if you go downtown onto Portage Avenue, I don't even, I'm afraid I don't even know the name of the new building where the Winnipeg Jets are playing. But at the time of this story, that was not where the Winnipeg Jets were playing. That was an old Eaton store. And here are my brothers and I getting out of the car in the parking lot right beside Eden's, and we were preparing to go do some shopping. And as we get out of the car, I look over, and there's my brother Don, and he's lighting a joint <laughs> as we start to walk into Eaton's through the parking lot. I said, what the hell are you doing? And he said, I'm just following your advice and taking that joint and holding it high and showing I'm proud. <laughs> and then he passed it to my other brother, who did the same thing. Uh, you have to understand, my brothers, that once they get an idea in their mind, there's no stopping them. That was a bit embarrassing for me. I'm lucky we didn't get busted, because back in those days, we probably would have got busted. But it taught me a really good lesson. Never play songs for my brothers when they come to visit, especially ones I've written, because they'll come back to bite you sometime later. (laughs) Though it was an amusing time, and we had a lot of fun during their particular visit, and I might even pull out another story that involves a a piano in a bar and them extracting the top of that piano over the course of the evening. But that's a story for another time. I have confirmed that I do have an interview lined up. In fact, we will be recording that interview early next week. And that is going to appear on our next episode of the Cannabis Podcast. And that interview is going to be with a friend of mine named Stacy. Stacy Kramer is her name. Stacy runs a medicinal cannabis therapy and holistic collective called Black Moon. And Stacy empowers and educates busy women on using cannabis holistically so they can achieve better health and wellness and a higher quality of life. I am really looking forward to that interview and that discussion. We're going to be recording that next week. So Stacy will be joining me on the next episode. And I hope we'll also dig up another cultivar corner and get back to a new strain. We'll find something that will be of interesting that we can talk about on Cultivar Corner next week. So I hope you come back and join us, because that is the end of Episode 18 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.